trying to see if anybody has our product. We could take the label off. Would that work? Yeah, that's perfect. Here she comes. You are great. Thank you. He can't be drinking out of Nestle when he's a general counsel of PepsiCo. You no, know, I got the Coke out of the house. Well, I think we'll get started. Um, we're very honored to have Larry Thompson here today, who's done so many different things in his career. He's now the general counsel and vice president of PepsiCo. He was deputy attorney general of the United States during 9-11 and um, has been a partner in the law firm, just done so many, so many different things. Welcome to Duke. It's good to be here. Yeah, this is the Pepsi generation, as you can see. Uh, you know, Dean, uh, I've practiced law for 40 years, and during the 40 years, I've uh, had many, many uh, lawyers who have worked, I've worked with and on the same side of matters from Duke, and, and uh, sort of unfortunately for me, I've opposed, some of my opposing counsel have been from Duke, and they, they've all been excellent lawyers, so it's really good to be here. And uh, professor, you and Professor Beal were classmates at uh, Michigan, I understand. But I'm a lot older than she is. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, why don't we just learn a little bit about how your career developed and uh, your growing up. I, you grew up in Missouri. Yes. Uh, in Hannibal, Missouri. Yes. And was Mark Twain still uh, alive then? No, he wasn't. <laughs> I just missed him a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but what was that like? Well, um, uh, so those of you who may not know where Hannibal, Missouri is, it's a, it's a town in northeast Missouri. It's uh, 18,000 people on the Mississippi River, about 110 miles North of um, north of St. Louis, and I grew up there in the 50s and early 60s. Interesting place. Uh, my mother was a cook. My dad worked on the uh, railroad. Um, neither one of them graduated from high school. Um, a, a small town, Midwestern atmosphere. Uh, this was during a time when the country was going through a lot of things from a racial standpoint. Um, uh, but I had very good parents. And I never thought, I never thought that uh, I couldn't do anything or couldn't accomplish anything. And the reason I'm telling that is that when I went on to college, I took a course in sociology my sophomore year, and we were talking about social class and the stratas. And I was reading uh, the textbook, and it, there was a classification of people that they called disadvantaged. And I'm reading all the indicia of people who were considered to be by the sociologists disadvantaged. And I said, hmm, I think I might be in this area. But I never ever, until I took that sociology course my sophomore year, I never ever thought that I was disadvantaged because I had two, two really terrific parents. Uh, so you, you went to college uh, right, a, right around there? Yes. And then, uh, and then I see that you went to, I think you went to Michigan State. Though. I did. Yeah. Okay, so what, what was that about? Well, um, so during, the t during that time period, um, we were in the middle of the Vietnam War, and I had always planned to go to law school after uh, college. Now, why is that? Why had you always planned to go to law school? Well, when I say always, it was my junior year in college. I actually, <laughs> actually, I was planning to be a social worker uh, up until the junior year, and one of the professors at this tiny little liberal arts college in, in, in Missouri, he uh, called me, um, to ask me to, to stay after class. And he said, Mr. Thompson, I understand that you want to go to the University of Missouri to be a social worker. And I'm a child of the 60s, and a lot of us wanted to do those socially relevant things in the 60s. And I said, yes, that's what I want to do, Professor Sperry. And he said, have you considered law school? And I had not considered law school. I didn't know any lawyers. There were very few lawyers in Hannibal, and my family never had to deal with lawyers. And I got interested in uh, the prospect of becoming a lawyer, and then that's when I decided I could. But at that point in time, you lost your deferment. 
um, from uh, eligibility for the draft if you were going to law school. That had been taken away. And so the way to get a deferment was to go and pursue a graduate degree and become a teaching assistant. I had a, I had a fellowship. I was a pretty good student. I had a fellowship to Columbia University. Um, I visited Columbia. They just had riots uh, where Columbia is located. Columbia is located very near Harlem in New York. And then Michigan State had the number one football team in the country. And uh, riots, football. <laughs> and a beautiful campus. <laughs> and so I decided uh, uh, that I wanted to go to Michigan State, and it was one of the best decisions I ever made. So you, st you studied at um, Michigan State, what, what was, for a year and got a master's, and that was in? Year and a half, year and a half. in industrial sociology. All right. I met my wife at Michigan State. Um, my wife is from Salisbury, North Carolina. Um, she graduated from North Carolina Central School University. Down the road here. Here in Durham. And so at that time, when she graduated, North Carolina was a different kind of place than it is now. She applied. She, had, she was a good student. She applied to go to the University of North Carolina because she wanted to be, get a PhD in psychology, and she was turned down and decided to go to Michigan State. So I have the state of North Carolina to thank uh, for my wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. So then... Uh, By the way, she was turned down, not because she was a good student. Yeah. She was turned down for... for yeah. uh, yes. Okay. For, because of her race. Yeah. Yeah. That was that, that time when things were starting to change, and, mm -hmm. but hadn't, hadn't changed. Right. So then, then uh, you and Sarah Beale go to the University of Michigan in, in Ann Arbor, and that was, that, was law school what you hoped it would be? I think so. I, you know, I, 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 I'm not from a legal, you know, I, my, I don't have legal people in, um, in my family, but it was uh, at the time, and I think Sarah would agree, it was a very exciting period. We, there were lots and lots of very bright people in our law school class. Um, you know, there was a you know, great deal of uh, camaraderie. I was around a lot of really bright people um, and developed a number of lifelong friendships. Uh, from that from that association at the University of Michigan Law School, and did you develop a vision of what you wanted to to do in the law? Somewhat. Uh, I had a professor by the name of Joe Viney, and uh, I was actually interested in becoming a labor lawyer. And I took a class from from Professor Viney called Legal Norms and Corporate Policy. But even back then, in 1973. Joe Vining was talking about such things as whether or not corporations should be subject to the criminal laws, what's the responsibility of a corporation, and I, I will say that, that that class got me interested in the kinds of things that I'm doing today. Right. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. So there's a sort of a unity there. Well, so after law school, what'd you do? Uh, after law school, I wanted to go back to my home state, Missouri. Um, uh, and I've often told law students that I've never taken a job for money. Uh, and that's true except maybe for the first job uh, that I took. So I wanted to um, practice in, in St. Louis. And I thought maybe going to St. Louis and maybe getting involved in politics. And at that time, you know, we were in a little debt, not a lot, but we were in some debt. And the law firms in St. Louis were starting uh, new lawyers out at fourteen thousand five hundred dollars a year. Uh, They'd like to do that again. If they <laughs> and I had a I had an alum from the University of, uh, of of Michigan, and one of the things is stay close to your your alums from a fine school like this. And he was the deputy general counsel of Monsanto. He had heard about me, and he offered me an opportunity to come to Monsanto at nineteen thousand dollars a year. So I joined the, the legal staff of Monsanto, and uh, it was a very, I, I was not there for a long period of time, but it was very interesting. There was another young lawyer on the legal staff from Yale University. And he was here not very long ago. <laughs> and uh, he's gone on to bigger and better things. This is Justice Thomas. Did you, did you know him then? Yes, no, yes. We went to lunch about every week. Went to a Chinese restaurant very, very close to me. Oh, really? How funny. Well, that's that's um, that's amazing. All right. So from so you you worked at Monsanto. So you were in house at that point. And did you like the work? 
It was very interesting. Uh, very, I, I did like the work. I, I early on, I got uh, very deeply involved in drafting, which, as a litigator, and you do complex settlement agreements and so forth, it's it's really come come in handy. Uh, learning how to draft things clearly and precisely, um, you know, that was a very very good experience. But I had decided that I really wanted to be a litigator. Uh, I really wanted to be a trial lawyer, and Monsanto didn't, you know, offer. Uh, the opportunities for that, that that I really wanted. And so uh, a law firm in St. Louis had recruited me from the University of Michigan. I turned them down. I had lunch with the partner. He said, you need to come come back. You know, we'll take you. Uh, I was talking to uh, a law firm that I was working with as an in-house lawyer at Monsanto by the name of King and Spalding in Atlanta. And uh, I told them that I was no longer going to be working with them. And they said, well, we didn't know you were thinking about leaving. Why don't you come to Atlanta and join us? That's how I got to King. So that, that was, uh, that probably was, in a, in a sense, the transformational move for you, moving to Atlanta yes. and joining that firm. It was. So um, let's talk about that a little bit. Was Griffin Bell there at that time, or, had he, or was that before he got he there? He was, uh, no, he was the Attorney General of the United States at that point. Uh, there are a lot of Duke graduates at uh, King and Spalding. You probably well, know many of them. Well, there was a graduate from the University of Michigan, Scott Arnold. You, uh, you, you may remember Scott, Sarah. And so, so there were there yeah. were there there were people there that you knew. And a lot of Duke graduates. A lot of Duke graduates. So, did you get to try cases and litigate cases? Not immediately, uh, but it was a it was a lot different then than it is now for for young lawyers. Uh, after a period of time, I um, uh, was trying cases. We were trying. We had warranty cases. One of the firm's main clients was uh, General Motors, and what you would do is go to the partner who was responsible for the General Motors account, and he would give you a bunch of cases. And these were lemon law cases, warranty cases, and you would go down to the state court of Fulton County, which is one level below the superior court, and you know, misdemeanor level court, and you would end up. You know, handling these cases, some of them would settle, some of the, some of them would go to trial. None of the trials lasted any more than a day. Uh, I've had several one-half-day trials, uh, but it's a trial. And and the other thing that I did uh, before associates were given some slack for pro bono work, I got involved um, in um, the public defender's office in Atlanta, and I because I had not tried misdemeanor cases. I was on the, what's called the B panel, and I tried misdem you know, misdemeanor cases. I had not tried felonies, and I tried misdemeanor cases, and that was a great experience. Too. Oh, that's wonderful. So and, uh, now we're in the late 70s and early 80s. Is this our time frame? Yes. So um, what about politics? Uh, and the reason I ask that is that you became the U.S. attorney right, well, in 1982, I think. So um, what was the lead up to that? That's a very prominent position. So you you were the U.S. Attorney in the Northern District of Georgia, which is an important office and a presidential appointment. Well, I got involved in politics again. Um, it was one of my extracurricular activities, and I want to stress too that I I was doing this kind of stuff and carrying a full load as an associate at King and Spalding. I, I was always interested and curious about about the law and about involvement in a lot of different things. And so I became um, what essentially was the lead position paper writer for a person who was running for Senate uh, in Georgia at the time, Mac Mattingly. Now we're talking about the 1980 election. Georgia had never elected a Republican statewide since Reconstruction. And Mac was running against Herman Talmadge, which is a very old and established name and family um, in the state of Georgia. Uh, and I, I liked Mac, and I got involved with, with Mac, and uh, he ended up winning in the Reagan Revolution. Uh, every partner at King & Spalding, every partner, including Judge Bell, who had just returned from Washington, every partner supported Herman Talmadge. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you have this associate. <laughs> the only he knows the United States Senator, the new United States Senator from the state of Georgia is this associate. <laughs> so that was an interesting time in my life. Um, Mac actually, at that time, this was 1980, Mac actually uh, asked me to become the United States Attorney. 
I didn't think, number one, that I was ready. I didn't think then that I was prepared to take the pay cut because I knew that I, I was told, at least, that I was on track to become a partner in the firm, and I didn't really want to subject my family to that kind of, uh, um, that kind of pay cut, if you will. And I, so he put me on the um, Judicial Selection Committee, which advised the senator on uh, judicial picks, the U.S. attorneys. Georgia has three United States attorneys, the judges. And um, we actually named um, two people to be the U.S. attorney um, before I became the United States, United States attorney. And they had different issues in their background. You, know, as you, you go through an extensive FBI check, and they, they dropped off. And um, <clears throat> Judge Bell um, was back in, and this is the way things happened back then. Judge Bell had come back to the firm. Um, the, the, the lawyer, uh, Earl, Earl Phillips, and you all may have heard of the firm Fisher & Phillips. It's a prominent employment law firm. Uh, I think they actually have offices in the Triangle area. But in any event, er, uh, Earl was uh, up, upset because we didn't have a U.S. attorney. Now this is 1982, two years into the Reagan term. The newspapers were critical of, um, of, of President Reagan and, and Mac Mattingly. And, and Judge Bell and uh, Earl got together and drafted me to be the United States Attorney, and that's, that's what happened. That's, that's how it happened. So uh, Griffin Bell was att uh, Attorney General in the Carter administration and had been a, a judge on the, on the Fifth Circuit, I think before the circuit split. And then uh, <laughs> after, after serving as Attorney General, he went back or he went to King and, and Spalding. I don't know, perhaps he had been there at some point. He had point. been there before. Had he? And he was always called Judge Bell thereafter, even though uh, he was not a judge any longer. Like someone else I know. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and he practiced there until not very long ago. He lived, he lived a, a very long time and uh, was quite revered. So uh, you became U.S. Attorney, and, and I think what, what might be interesting about that is that uh, you were young, and you had never held a management position before. No. So I, it would be interesting to hear you reflect on that, uh, because it's often said that lawyers are, are absolutely the worst managers. So you probably had 50 or 60 lawyers? In At that time, it was considered, uh, it was a, considered a medium-sized office going to a large office. Now it's one of the largest office, offices in the country, but at that time, it was you know, on, on its way up. The metropolitan Atlanta area was growing. Right. Um, and I had not had any management experience. I had, I had very little trial experience. So this is something. It's a stretch. Uh, this is something that uh, you ought to think about in terms of your careers and in terms of taking advantage of all the opportunities that, um, that are available to you. So you remember I mentioned that I, I took, uh, I was in the Federal Defender's Office. And in the Federal Defender's Office, you don't try felonies. You do try misdemeanors. You, you handle a lot of habeas corpus cases. So one of the significant cases I was assigned to uh, was a habeas corpus case dealing with effective assistance of counsel. And uh, I was able to persuade uh, the magistrate judge for evidentiary hearing as to whether my client had a effective assistance of counsel. His lawyer at the time was one of the top African-American lawyers in Atlanta, but who was old. And he was, you know, he really was too old to have been trying this case. He was in his 80s, but he had a, a you know, a really, really big name, larger than life presence. And so um, there came a time when I had to exa cross-examine this lawyer and other judges in the courthouse. This is, a, this is before a magistrate judge, but other regular federal judges in the courthouse were coming down to watch this young associate from King and Spalding, Spalding cross-examine this uh, very famous lawyer about whether or not he had given the client uh, effective assistance. And um, it was an interesting, th interesting period in my career. The Atlanta Constitution covered it. Uh, and at the end, I never wanted to get into things like effective assistance or inadequate. But at the end, I got him to admit that he could have done better. And uh, so when the issue of my lack of trial experience came up, uh, the magistrate judge and 
a couple of the other federal judges gave interviews to the Atlanta Constitution and said they'd seen me in court and they thought I would do fine. And so this is how everything happens in your career uh, in terms of just being prepared to, um, you know, luck will come your way, and just being prepared to take advantage of. So you go into the thing. you go into the U.S. Attorney's Office, and you have this whole mixture of people. You've got some career prosecutors, and they probably thought you were a whippersnapper, and uh, and then you have other people who. Um, are on the civil side, and they do civil work, and they have a different kind of mentality. And then you have people that are, are young and are going to be there for a little while, but intend to go into private practice. It's a whole, it's a whole mixture. Of, it's a whole mixture. It's a whole mixture. So what, and, and, and I, I came in in 82. So the, the Atlanta office in 82 was interesting, not like the Atlanta office today, and not like US attorney's offices today. But the Atlanta office, quite frankly, had been an office where there had been some patronage, political patronage, although you're, you're not supposed to have that kind of thing in, in um, US attorney's office offices, and a lot of state uh, prosecutors. And um, they'd had more trial experience than, than I had, but you know, I, I was in a large law firm that handled very complex matters, especially very complex litigation matters. And so in a sense, even though I didn't have the in-courtroom experience that a lot of the lawyers who were older than I, uh, I had a lot more experience in handling complex and, yeah. and, and, and very sensitive kinds of cases. And that put me into um, good stead, I think, you know, with the office. Now, I did a terrible job of managing that office because I really wanted to try cases. <laughs> And uh, I look back, when I was deputy attorney general many years later, I would never allow a US attorney to do what I did. <laughs> uh, but I, I tried cases, and I argued cases on appeal. Uh, I was kind of like a kid in the candy store. It was a great experience. You get to know, you get to know a lot of people. Uh, one of the individuals, you mentioned this, uh, Dean, you mentioned the civil side, one of the individuals who was transferring from the civil side to the criminal side. His name is Jerry Moorhead. And Jerry and I tried a tax protester case together. They wanted to bring a, a lawyer in to try a case with me. And one of the things I always tell people when you deal with them, you manage people like one day you will be working for them. And Jerry, this past year, has just been named the president of the University of Georgia. Now you're working for him. Um, now I'm working for him. <laughs> As you're also on the faculty at Georgia, we, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, so let's, if we, if we kind of put ourselves back into the mentality of the times of uh, 1982, uh, let's see if you agree with this. Um, there was a lot more crime then, and crime rates had been rising um, fairly dramatically through the 1970s, and so it was on the, it was in the forefront of uh, people's thinking, you know, New York felt very unsafe, and people had 10 locks on their doors, that sort of thing. And uh, the demographics were different. So there, uh, people were very concerned about crime, and, and we were in the midst of the, the drug war, mm -hmm. uh, which had ramped up very considerably, and there was a sense then that maybe it was winnable, <laughs> but maybe not. And uh, I'd just be interested in any reflections you have. Yes, that's a very, that's a very, very good. Uh, we spent a lot of time on drug enforcement during that during that period. In fact, um, the Southeast, including this state, we were we were sort of united into an organized crime drug enforcement task force, which included Georgia and North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida. Uh, and uh, as you know, President Reagan declared a war on drugs. Uh, my boss at the Department of Justice was Rudy Giuliani, uh, who, by the way, takes credit for naming me as the UN United States Attorney until I disabuse him of the fact that I was his third choice. <laughs> but, <laughs> he still named you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we, uh, in fact, one of the cases I tried was a two and a half month trial involving um, a international drug conspiracy uh, involving some people from Colombia, involving the Gambino family, uh, who was, they were trying to make inroads into the southeast, involving some, involving some traditional North Georgia 
type uh, old time um, uh, uh, rum runners who are trying to get into cocaine. It's a big case. Um, but the, we spent a lot of time, we, we took down a lot of uh, pounds of cocaine. And if you look back and think about all, the, all, of, the, all of what you did, in, in one way you're proud of it, um, but in another way it, it really hasn't made any difference. And um, I was talking to the dean this morning, and, and one of the things when I went to becoming a federal prosecutor that I wanted to do, because attacking this problem um, on the supply side is clearly not the right way to deal with it. Now, you have to deal with the violence that's associated with it. And during that trial, uh, we didn't have a federal death penalty statute, and so it was a RICO case and a RICO conspiracy, and uh, there were murders that we proved up in that case. And uh, these individuals who were convicted by that jury in 1984 are still in jail. They're still in prison. They got life without, basically life without uh, probation. Type experience uh, uh, sentences, but you have to deal with the violence. But um, I think we need another approach. But one of the things that I was telling uh, the dean about that I wish w I could have done um, was maybe trying to attack uh, this problem, and it's a real big issue from the supply side, because quite frankly, when you visit Colombia, when you visit Brazil, they will or visit Mexico, as I have done. They will, uh, the Attorney General of Mexico, I visited with him uh, as the General Counsel of PepsiCo, but, you know, he turned to me and said, you're responsible for the drugs. The demand side, yeah. yeah. You're, you guys are responsible for the drugs. And so I wanted to approach it from the demand side, and if you look, I don't know if it would have worked, it would have been very controversial, but if you look at what has happened with drinking and driving, uh, we've done a pretty effective job as a society of, um, on, on, in terms of changing our attitudes about drinking and driving. I mean, we've done a pretty good job. I remember my first day at Monsanto as a lawyer, and my uh, supervisor comes to me at, you know, around 5 o'clock and wants to congratulate me my first day su successfully finishing the first day. And we go out, and it was a cocktail hour, and I think we had two or three drinks, maybe three. Then this is... 1974, and um, nobody thought anything of it. No one would do that today. No responsible person would do that today. We've really changed our, our attitudes about that. And I was thinking that maybe perhaps if we had a, a, national, um, a national effort on the demand side, it would work. It would, it would have been very controversial right. because the, the, the federal judges don't want to see these small cases in their courts. But uh, um, and the chief justice of the state of Nebraska uh, was the person that I put in charge. He's now the chief justice, but he was the U.S. attorney for the uh, district of Nebraska, and he was the person I put in charge of this uh, demand side enforcement effort. But when, what you, when you were deputy, when or I was deputy, when but we never got to it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we seem to be going in the in a, in a different direction now, and I, I, it's it's a little hard to to know where it ends up, but with with legalized marijuana in, in the in the West, then I, I it was always said that that it was important. At least I've heard multiple U.S. attorney generals say that if the United States were to legalize marijuana, it would make it virtually impossible for them to argue against heroin and cocaine in foreign countries because they would say, "Well, you're you're growing your crop, and we're growing our crop." Mm -hmm. and, um, well, I think and there's I, something to that. Professor Beale and I went to law, law school in a city that had legalized marijuana at the time. It, it, it's, uh, I won't ask you anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Professor. <laughs> I'm very curious. Um, so, I mean, that, that w when we think about our, our criminal justice system, it's, um, it's hard to be very um, upbeat about it. I mean, partly that's just the nature of the enterprise perhaps, but uh, some of these things that began with such good, good intention then end up, can, end up in a direction where you're, you're uncomfortable. I'll give you an example of that. So when I was U.S. Attorney, which I started in 86, just as you were ending, and I think it was in about 1988 that crack came in. Yes. So a little after your, your time. So crack, crack cocaine is um, smokable cocaine. 
and it's, it's, it's essentially cocaine with some baking soda, and you cook it on a stove, and you probably know more about this than I do, but um, I don't, don't mean that <laughs> you have personal knowledge of it. <laughs> but it, when, it, when it first came in, it was, it was very cheap, and it appealed to poor people. It swept through some of the African-American neighborhoods like lightning, just at a point where it looked like drug use was going down. And then it had very tragic consequences because if a pregnant woman used it, the baby would be addicted and often had birth defects and that sort of thing. So there were all these crack babies, and it was appalling. And I remember the department really wanted to, to jump on that. Well, so the department did jump on it with the result that it prosecuted a whole lot of poor black people. And, and then that looked very unequal, and it was unequal because the guidelines for crack were so high. And the reason the guidelines for crack were so high is that people felt so strongly about it initially. But now it, seems, now it feels very unfair. So I, what, do you, what do you make of all of this? Yeah, we, had that, we had that issue in Atlanta just as I was leaving. And I remember, uh, uh, I remember testifying uh, before the Sentencing Commission about the disparity. But at that time, uh, the, my testimony was in favor of the disparity, in favor of the increased um, penalties simply because uh, the people who were smoking this stuff were devastating their own communities, primarily African American communities <laughs> in Atlanta. And what, what's interesting about criminal uh, criminal enforcement at that period, some of the staunchest supporters of the increased penalties were members of the Congressional Black Caucus, black congressmen, because uh, their constituents were 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 really being victimized by some of these crackheads. So obviously it was unfair, and things have changed. But you know it's hard to predict where things are going to come out. I, I uh, uh, when when we were doing the kinds of things that we did in Atlanta, um, targeting some of the organized crime gangs and targeting some of the um, organizations that were dealing with uh, uh, drug importation into the United States, we received a great deal of um, positive um, support from the newspapers, from other people. And then you fast forward to later on in my career when I'm a, again become a uh, federal prosecutor and use some of the basic techniques that we use to get at these organized crime uh, families. And, 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 and of course, I was criticized for you know, stigmatizing business. So it's, 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 it's really interesting how we as a, as a society are conflicted about criminal enforcement. Um, we, have, we have no problem advocating for criminal enforcement for people who may be um, less advantaged on the social, social status. But those same techniques for people like you and I, uh, for people in the business world and people in the corporate suites, uh, then all of a sudden people, a lot of people will say, you're going too far. I want to get to that. Um, why don't we, in fact, why don't we get to that phase of your life? So you, you went back to, to King and Spalding, and you were a partner, and I, I know you were doing quite a bit of, um, I, I think you were doing white-collar work, actually, at, at a time maybe when other, other big firms weren't doing that. And then you became Deputy Attorney General, and that's the number two person in the Department of Justice. It's a very important position. And um, how did that happen? How did it happen that you were selected? Do you recall? Um, I got a call from... Um, Al Gonzalez, who was White House counsel, um, and, and on behalf of then Governor Bush, uh, the governor had been elected, so he was the president elect, but he had not been sworn in. And um, he asked me, did I want to be the uh, uh, number two person in the Department of Justice? And um, my initial reaction, and he, he said that the president had asked him to give me a call. And my initial reaction was, at this point in time, I'm 55 years old. Um, uh, I have a great practice in Atlanta. I would have to take a 90% pay cut to do this job. Um, why would I want to do that and be number two? And, uh, <laughs> uh, and then I just thought about it. Uh, again, um, um, and I don't want to be too sentimental about this, but uh, Griffin Bell who was the senior partner, my senior partner for a number of years, and I practiced with 
Judge Bell for 16 years. You know, he was, he's been such a, a wonderful influence on my life. And, uh, excuse me, and I, I went to, uh, I talked to Judge Bell about this. And he said, anytime you have a chance to serve your country and the president wants you to do so, you should do it. Don't, wor don't worry about what's going to happen. Well, I was 55 and taking a 90% pay cut. But, uh, you know, I thought about it and uh, I, I did it. And it was absolutely, especially given what happened, unfortunately, to our, to our country after that, it was absolutely the right thing for me to do. So you started in 2001. Yes. At the, at the beginning of the year. And the Attorney General then was another Missourian. Yes. Uh, John Ashcroft. We did not know each other. But you, you didn't know each other. Uh, and then in September, we had 9-11, which um, came out of the blue, I take it. I mean, this was not something. You knew about Al-Qaeda probably, but I mean, it wasn't. We knew, uh, Dean, we knew something was going to happen. There was so much noise in the system around July, August of 2001. I think it's fair to say that... I, all the people in the national security world knew that something was going to happen. No one had any idea that we were going to be attacked on our homeland. No one had that. Do you, do you remember that day? It would just be interesting to know what, what, you know, what happened to you that day. I'll never, for, never forget that day. Um, I was in the process early in the morning of meeting with the United States Attorney for the District of Rhode Island. Um, she had uh, developed a very, very interesting and I think uh, important uh, organized crime case in Providence. Uh, not the first organized crime case ever in Providence, but uh, this was another one. <laughs> <clears throat> and we were getting ready to meet, and then you know you see the you see the images on the TV. I had a TV monitor in my. See the images of the one of the twin towers had been hit by a plane. And then I saw the second plane come in and hit the Twin Towers, and I knew immediately um, that we were under an attack. Uh, John was out of the, out of, not out of the country, he was not in Washington, he was on a speaking engagement. Um, so at that point in time, I uh, ordered the Department of Justice to be, building Main Justice to be evacuated. Um, I then get a call from Condi Rice, who was the National Security Advisor, um, asking me to stay put, don't leave. Um, I got a call from Richard Clark, who was a very senior executive in the national security area, and we were talking about something that was to this day classified. And, uh, and, and in about 10 minutes, a whole group of United States Marshals literally arrested me, and they I hope they read you your, your rights. <laughs> <laughs> well, they basically, they didn't do that, but they basically didn't ask me uh, do you want to come with us? They basically took me, put me in a van. It was a mess. Um, we were driving up on sidewalks, and uh, we eventually go to um, um, the undisclosed location where a number of s senior government officials were then being assembled because you know we, we thought we needed to go to that location because we thought that Washington was under a serious attack. So who, who takes over? The, the president was in Florida, as I recall. You know, when, when you have one of these unexpected catastrophes, uh, is there a, a pecking order? I mean, Condi Rice calls you, but you, you might say, gee, I mean, maybe I should have called you. I, you know, who's in charge? <laughs> you remember that when, uh, who was it? You know, it was back That's when. A, uh, when <laughs> General um, uh, Haig. Haig. He said, I'm in charge here. And yeah. people said, no, you're not. <laughs> you just think you are. Well, I think technically the vice president you know, would have been in charge, but yeah. for all practical purposes, uh, Condi's office was, was basically running uh, the operational aspects of what to do with uh, at least the senior government officials. So I would say from an operational standpoint, she was in charge. So I, I saw you thereafter on a number of occasions, and I know you were, you were very worried that there would be another attack, and we've had other things happen uh, and attempts in the Boston Marathon. That sort of thing. Uh, we haven't had another major attack. Not... Yes. But how how safe do you think we are? 
Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, one of the things that we did right as a, as a country and as a civilized society um, around the world is that Al-Qaeda was, was really far along in all these evil plans with respect to not only the United States, but other cities around the world. And after we were hit, um, one of the great things that I think we did, as you know, we now see all the dysfunctionality of Congress, but at that period of time, Congress came together, Republicans and Democrats, uh, and we, we were able to get authorization to deal with some of the people involved, involved in Al-Qaeda uh, and, and capture them or otherwise deal with them. And I think that helped um, I, I think that helped uh, in terms of these major attacks. Uh, they were very far along in their planning, and that, that stalled it. But you know, I've, I've told you this, in my uh, almost four years, I attended uh, briefings every day um, in the um, FBI building, and then we would go to the White House and brief the president. Every day, every day we had some intelligence about someone around the world trying to kill Americans someone around the world trying to attack us on the homeland. Uh, I'm not privy to classified information now, but uh, I don't think it's changed. Um, and, it's, and, and it's like a baseball game, because uh, to be successful, if we are going to be successful against the terrorist, you know, it's like having to pitch a no-hitter every single game for how, how many games, 162 games, a year, every year, you have to pitch a no-hitter. All the bad guy has to do is to eke out one single or one bunt, and he or she has won the game. And it's a, it's a, it's, the odds are stacked against us, but we do have to protect ourselves. I think there are people who are planning to do harm to us in this country, and, um, and, and we are still struggling as a, as a society, and perhaps as we should, um, with exactly how to deal with it. We clearly don't want to give the executive branch, and I'm not in favor of that, by the way. We don't want to give the executive branch a blank check. We have to focus on prevention, but when you focus on prevention, and that was one of the major changes that John Ashcroft and I did after 9-11, was redirect the way the Department of Justice dealt with terrorism, because it doesn't do any good if you have 19 people who are willing to sacrifice their lives for some evil purpose. Trying to prosecute them makes no sense after the fact prosecution. So you have to focus on prevention, and prevention touches some of the things that we hold dear as a society, you know, civil liberties and so forth, and we've, we've got to get that, that issue right. From a personal standpoint, those of you who may go into government service. The other thing we have to get right is people like myself who are in public service. Uh, how do you, you know, we have to make tough calls sometimes. Um, so if you Google my name, you'll see that I've been sued many, many times uh, uh, in dealing with some of these issues. And one of the things that I've been sued about was a, a person who we got information on who was trans transiting through the United States on his way to Canada. He had a dual Canadian uh, Syrian um, citizenship. And I made, because John was out of the country, I made the decision to um, send him to Syria. He claims he was tortured. If I had done that, knowing that he was going to be tortured, that's a criminal act, uh, and I would be subject to prosecution. Well, the Department of Justice defended me in terms of the, um, the um, Bivens case that was filed against me. By, by him, but there are all kinds of things that I had to deal with in terms of requests for interviews by the Inspector General, uh, requests to appear before Congress, and the department, uh, the government would not represent me, and I wanted to have a lawyer to represent myself. And the bottom line is I had to spend $27,000 out of my own pocket to, to, vit, to defend myself. I was lucky. A lot of other people in government have to spend more than that out of their own pocket. So we've got to deal with some way to um, protect public officials when they have to make tough, tough calls. How do you think the lawyers did? I mean, this, this being America, everything or many things end up being 
the subject of, of law in one way or another, or litigation. You've talked, you've touched on that now. But so you probably didn't know what war, water boarding was when you. I didn't. I never heard of that term. <laughs> <laughs> when you took the oath of office, and all of a sudden you're dealing with torture memoranda and what is appropriate interrogation, and then and now I suppose you're. Counterparts at the department are trying to figure out what the national security agencies are doing and and what what regulations or presidential orders ought to issue. How, how do you how do you evaluate it? You know how how did we do? Well, first of all, our profession. Uh, right after 9/11, I was so proud of of our profession. You know, we get a lot of criticism, but I had defense lawyers. I had lawyers who had been prosecutors. Uh, I had a number of lawyers write me or call me and offer offering to volunteer their services um, you know, after 9-11 too, in the interest of protecting and serving the country. And I thought that was great. I was really, really proud of the legal profession because we are trained in a way to really deal with the essential issues associated with our country being attacked and how do you deal with those uh, from the standpoint of legal process, protecting our civil liberties because we never want to have the bad people change the essential character of this great country. But I was really proud of our profession. And, um, you know, I think we're doing okay. We're conflicted a little bit. Uh, we do have to, you know, uh, the, my rule of thumb, yeah, and I may have, and may, you may think that I may have made mis some mistakes, but my rule of thumb when I was in government was to err on the side of public safety. And if I was going to have to make a close call, I would err on the side of public safety as opposed to other considerations. I don't know if that was the right thing to do. Uh, um, sometimes we did say no to certain things uh, that uh, our agents were uh, advancing in the, in the interest of prevention. But those were easy things to say no to. But if it was a close call, I would tend to err on the side of public, public safety as opposed to other issues, other considerations. Let's talk about corporate criminal liability here a little bit, because um, in your current role, obviously you're your general counsel of a of a company, and as the as the deputy attorney general, you were you were very tough on uh, corporations. And the Thompson Memoranda of the time um, instructed prosecutors around the country not to uh, enter into cooperation agreements or plea agreements with companies unless, uh, this, this is probably simplifying matters a little bit too much, but unless the, uh, the company would waive the attorney-client privilege and also uh, deny its uh, senior employees uh, the support of the company in hiring an attorney, and which you just mentioned is, you know, is an important factor when somebody is, is uh, facing litigation or, or questioning. And... Um, and we're living in an era here where, where companies are paying enormous sums of money to the government uh, every time you open the paper. Um, you see this. So um, what's your take on it all? <laughs> you know? So um, I don't know how many of you remember what was happening in 2002 when we went through a spate of corporate scandals associated with fraud in major corporations. Uh, many of them went bankrupt. For example, you've all heard of Enron. Enron, at the time, had what we call a market value uh, of, um, and that's, how, that's the amount of money that people like you and I had put into mutual funds or buying the Enron stock individually. Had a market value of about uh, 40, excuse me, but yeah, about $40 billion. And because of the fraud that occurred, in one day, in one day, poof, we, the investors, lost $40 billion. You can't, you can spend, you know, years robbing banks and not get to $40 billion. So this was, this was a very serious issue. We did not have a lot of resources. Uh, probably about half of the FBI's agents were now dedicated to national security matters, but it was a serious issue. Um, you know, the president clearly wanted us to investigate and deal, and deal with this criminal problem with dispatch. Ameri you know, typically white collar cases would take four and five years to investigate and then eventually bring someone to prosecution. We didn't have the time. So the so-called Thompson memo did not say that uh, corporations had to waive the attorney-client privilege. What it did say was that if you wanted to receive credit for cooperation, you couldn't hide behind the attorney-client privilege. 
um, in terms of cooperating with the government. So if you wanted to um, claim that you can't, you know, because of whatever the way you conducted the investigation, um, if, if, if you wanted to claim uh, that you can't cooperate with the government, government, you can't make certain disclosures to the government because of attorney-client privilege, and there was no other way to do it, then you had to think about waiving that privilege. But it didn't say that, you know, a number of companies cooperated without ever waiving the attorney-client privilege during, during that time. And with respect to fees, uh, we, we didn't say that you couldn't represent, uh, you couldn't pay for the representation of uh, your executives and employees. And in fact, a number of, um, a number of, uh, Corporate bylaws require the indemnification of uh, executives who are involved in matters. But, but again, if you knew that um, Mary Jones, who was the vice president of, of um, one of your divisions, and you knew uh, that she had done something wrong, it's not an indication of cooperation if you now are paying for her attorney's fees and trying to keep her quiet. This is what the mafia does all the time. Uh, you know, the, the mafia will uh, pay for the attorneys, uh, attorney fees for a lot of their, or, uh, their members. And uh, in fact, that attorney's not representing the individual. That attorney's representing the organization. So we have sort of an analogous situation in corporate law. Uh, the point I make is that when you apply these kinds of things to the C-suite as opposed to street crime or drug matters, uh, you get a completely different reaction from a, you know, a segment of the, of the country, the population. So now you're you're in the C-suite, and what 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 do you like best about um, being at Pepsi in in a mm -hmm. high position? You know the um, the corporation in 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 today's world. Joe Vining, Professor Beal will recall. Joe Vining talked about the corporation as being one of the maybe the second most important form of human organiza organizations. We humans organize ourselves. We have governments. Um, and after governments, we organize ourselves into corporations. Corporations uh, are enormously influential, enormously important all around the world. They're, they're also enormously powerful. Uh, you can channel the power that a corporation uh, exerts in good ways and bad ways. You know, I'd like to think as the general counsel of a large global corporation with uh, over $65 billion in revenue and 300,000 people that we're doing, we're doing it for the interest not only of our shareholders, but for the interest of society, which in the long term is in the interest of our shareholders. So I, I, I like thinking that we're trying to do that. I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I'm going to throw it open. So if you were coming out of law school today, what, 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 what would you hope to do? What, with the benefit of a 40-year legal career, you know, I've always wanted, I always have enjoyed uh, trial work. And, and some, some of you may be interested in M&A work and, and, and will be great M&A lawyers, but I've always enjoyed trial work. I've enjoyed being a litigator because you have to know a lot about a lot of different things at all times. And I get this with, the, with my students at the University of Georgia. And I guess there's so many opportunities today in areas where there are they really are underserved by lawyers. So I think if, you know, I, you asked me this and I really hadn't thought about it, I think I would seriously think about maybe going to a small town, uh, taking a job as a public defender or, um, um, or um, a prosecutor, an assistant DA, learning, you know, getting into court very early in my career, learning to try cases, learning to be involved in the fabric of a community. That's what we lawyers do. Now I know and I may be romanticizing this, I, I didn't come out of law school with loans and things like that, and I know it's hard for law students today to have that kind of approach, but uh, I would look for opportunities to get as much experience practicing law and things that I am interested in um, um, as I possibly could. That's what I've done in my career. I've, just, I've done things that I'm interested in, I've done things that I think are important to me and important to society, and I've really never taken a job for money. So that's what I would do. What a terrific career. OK, who's got a question? Don't be shy. Yes, sir. Could you please give uh, more insight into how you went about evaluating your various transitions in your career? 
because you made a number of them, but they're in very different types of law and type positions. So the, the question is, uh, how you, could you speak a little bit more about the different transitions in your career and how you, it, how you reflected at those different transitions? Yes. Um, first of all, from a personal standpoint, you know, obviously I've had a, a very good mate in life, and especially when I would, at age 55, decide to take a 90% pay cut. You have to make sure that your family is on board with that. But beyond that, I think it gets back to, you know, what, what is, you know, what am I interested in? Uh, what, what, what kind of role can I play in our society? And one of the great things about our profession uh, is that we have an opportunity because our, you know, our society is based upon um, legal principles. Our freedom is based upon legal principles. Uh, important business transactions cannot get uh, consummated without our involvement. So the great thing about our profession is that we are trained to have a great deal of impact on society, a great deal of impact on our clients, a great deal of impact on the way things are done. And so I, I, I just looked at things that were important to me, values that, values that are important to me. I, again, I want to point it, it, there are people who don't need to necessarily go into public service, but one of my mentors in my career has been Griffin Bell. Um, Judge Bell was back and forth between the executive branch, the, judi the judicial branch, private practice. And um, so he inculcated in me a, a great sense of importance of public service uh, as a lawyer. So that's been something that's, you know, has been important to me um, throughout my career. Um, but it's on a personal basis that I evaluate, you know, these transitions. Um, and when I had the opportunity to, to go into uh, the general counsel role, I, you know, I had not been a corporate lawyer. And what had happened was, uh, after Enron, after WorldCom and all these corporate scandals of 2002, a number of boards decided that they wanted the general counsel to be a person with the kind of background that I had as opposed to a more technical corporate lawyer or M&A specialist. And again, I, I saw an opportunity to do something that was very interesting and, and to do something uh, that I thought had the potential to make a difference, to be relevant. Uh, so uh, it's kind of a vague answer, but it, 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 nothing has been planned. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. When we study them, we kind of look at them 10 years after the fact, but um, what were the internal DOJ discussions like, in your opinions, on the torture memos uh, in 2002 and 2003 when they were first being drafted? Um, do you have any thoughts then versus now, looking at them 12 years after the fact? Yes. Um, again, you, you, you have to think about the overall purpose of <coughs> what we were trying to do, which was prevention and public safety. No one. Uh, no one of us who were in those positions at the time um, wanted to do, wanted to be um, in government and, and, and be involved with another attack on our country. You know, over 3,000 of our fellow citizens were murdered, and w no one wanted to see that again. So you want to start with that proposition. Um, I think everything that was done uh, was done in good faith. Uh, were, were mistakes made? You know, absolutely mistakes were made. There was no manual. There, uh, Professor Beale knows that there's something called the United States Attorney's Manual, which in different volumes, and it's on the in bookshelves of all the prosecutors around, <coughs> around the country. And it tells U.S. attorneys what to do from every stage of a matter, grand jury to conviction to sentencing. There was no manual to say, what do you do when over 3,000 of your fellow, fellow citizens have been murdered. So first of all, I think everything was done in good faith. It probably should have been more transparent. Uh, that's one of the things that I learned. That, you know, it's, it's very difficult to do things with a cloak of secrecy uh, because you need, you need to get a lot of the input in. Um, and I find it interesting that the people who are criticizing the so-called torture memos I, I like to call them enhanced interrogation <laughs> techniques. Uh, have no problem with sending drones in and killing people 
with a lot less safeguards. I find that a very interesting proposition. That's my political statement. <laughs> We're in a drone-free zone, I hope, right now. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, well, I, I've heard that uh, Pepsi has been involved in a lot of these large-scale public health measures in, in terms of reducing the calories in their soda, and they've been expected to have you know, billions of calories consumed globally, reduced just by cutting 100 calories from a can of soda. And I was wondering if those type of public health measures or other corporate responsibility initiatives are something that, now that you are away from the DOJ, or something as general counsel you, you uh, advise towards, or what you're view of, of that. Yes, absolutely. I think uh, um, we, we, PepsiCo, and other food and beverage companies have a responsibility to our consumers, and we have a responsibility to our shareholders also. So they really can come together because I think uh, if you look around um, when I, uh, people are consuming less, you know, sugar-sweetened beverages, so I think it's incumbent upon us, you know, not, not only for our consumers to find and offer healthier choices, healthier options, but it's better for the long-term growth of our, our company from the shareholder standpoint uh, to stay in tune with consumer needs and, and, and consumer taste. But it, uh, it's important for us to not um, ignore the issues with respect to diabetes and obesity. Obviously, those, what causes that, those things, those diseases, if you will, or conditions, very complex. But we can't ignore it. And we're trying very hard. And, and um, we have hired at PepsiCo um, lots of people in R&D and scientists to, to deal with how to make our products healthier, to uh, offer people more choices. And um, you know, I think it's the right thing to do, both from a standpoint of societal responsibility <coughs> as a citizen uh, of society, but also for our shareholders. So let's, let's stop there. Um, what, a, what a wonderful opportunity to hear from one of our leaders. And you've really been a, a tremendous force for good in the legal profession, and you continue to this day. I'll offer one. So before we part, I, I would offer one observation. You know, as an old guy, you know, my sons tell me I I'm always offer these <laughs> observations too much. But seriously, one of the th this is a great law school. Um, stay in touch with each other. Um, uh, stay in touch with each other over the years after you graduate. Stay in touch uh, with your professors. Uh, you know, you have one of the most remarkable lawyers in our country, and, and, and Dean Levy. Stay in touch with him uh, because this is what it's about in your career. It's an ongoing, evolving process. You know, I, I stayed in touch with Joe Vining over the years. Professor Beal and I would go talk to his class almost every year when he was teaching. Uh, so um, I would just offer that as an uh, you know, observation uh, because uh, you know, I, uh, I've looked at the admission standards for this law school. I, I wouldn't have gotten in here. <laughs> so just stay in touch with, you, with each other, and um, I think everything's going to work out. We're in a great profession. You're all smart, and you know, every, everything will work out for you. Thank you very much.